Well, good evening, everyone, and uh, welcome. Thank you for joining this webinar, which is based on resources and approaches for teachers. My name is Anna Sutton, and as Rebecca explained, um, I'm a professional tutor on the Level 5 course at the BDA. My colleague Sarah is uh, going to be joining us later on for the Q&A session. So now, hopefully, I'm going to share my presentation with you. You may need access to a pen and paper um, because there are a few short activities at the start of the presentation. OK, hold on a moment. OK, hopefully you can see the presentation. Well, this webinar is designed for teachers and educators, and it considers learners with dyslexia of all ages. There should be something for everyone to take away this evening for you to investigate further or use in your own practice. Our theme this year is breaking through barriers, and this runs through the presentation from identifying what those barriers are to informing what we can do to empower learning, thus creating a dyslexia-friendly learning environment. Um, the PowerPoint contains quite a bit of detail, but the idea is that it's divided into sections, and when you re receive the slides later on, you'll be able to um, access them in the sections and use them as a useful resource in your own practice. There's also a, a reference page at the end for um, sources that are included within the presentation. So what is dyslexia? Well, before I answer this question, I invite you to take part in five short activities designed to make us reflect on the potential barriers to learning faced by all learners with dyslexia in daily life, whether that's in school, at college or in the workplace. Here's activity one. Read this word. Hopefully you can see it. And the secret is, if the GH sound in enough is pronounced and the O in women makes the short I sound and the TI in nation is produced SH, then the word G-H-O-T-I is pronounced just like fish. Welcome to the English language. <laughs> okay. So the first barrier um, you notice here is the language barrier. And the English language is a code. Um, this exemplifies the complexities of the English language, um, which is a melting pot of languages reflecting the social changes in the UK for thousands of years. It is complex. Um, the first aspect is phonology. You know, some words are made up of sounds that can be blended and segmented to form words, such as cat, k, at. Other parts of our language are made up of morphology, so some words have morphemes or word units that have a meaning. So we may start with the base word love. You can add the suffix able, lovable, or the prefix un, unlovable, and meanings can change. Our language and the words in our language are also based on orthography. We learn the visual shape of words, their letter sequence and order, to be able to spell those words that don't follow any rules, like there because, friend, and we need to have a good vocabulary. Uh, we need to be able to understand and make sense of the words we read and come across. So fish, found to live in water, it has fins and swims. Now an individual with dyslexia may experience difficulties with each of these skills, and they are required for reading and spelling. And a core difficulty in dyslexia is the ability to detect and manipulate the sounds of language or what we call phonological skills. This in turn affects the acquisition of phonics, 
remembering letter order, reading and spelling accurately and fluently. It is therefore understandable that frustration may be experienced at each level of education, whether learning language skills in the early years or as an adult having unreliable uh, reading and spelling. And this makes access to literature and expressing ourselves through writing very difficult. So here's the next activity. So handwrite a text message to your friend, but exclude all the vowels. You have a time limit for this of just 10 seconds. You may begin now. Okay, how did this activity make you feel? Was the automaticity taken away from you? Perhaps the process became much slower. Maybe you were hoping for predictive text to help you out here. Did the time limit provide added pressure? Did it make you feel anxious, maybe self-doubting or frustrated? An individual with dyslexia may know what they want to say, but expressing it or getting it down on paper can be a real challenge. Get ready for the next activity. Okay, number three. This time you have 10 seconds to draw a well-known rail company sign, the British Rail sign. Okay, starting now. How did this make you feel? Perhaps you tried visualizing the symbols. Did you try tracing it out first? Maybe you had a couple of attempts. Perhaps you have trouble with drawing and holding the pen, or maybe this was easy for you. This barrier is related to skills such as copying from the board or a book. That's going to be difficult if you have any um, trouble with any of these skills. However, this might be a strength of yours. Perhaps symbols and images are quick to recall and help with remembering information. A tip for completing this task would be to teach it in steps or chunks and demonstrate drawing each line in stages. Chunking complex tasks into steps makes it easier to perform and practice is key to secure the process. Activity four, can you read this sample of text? Okay, sometimes the barrier might be accessing the print itself. Perhaps a learner in your class may um, experience visual discomfort or complain of seeing blurred print. Occasionally, the eyes may focus on the gaps between the words than the words themselves, or they may have trouble lining up. Sometimes a learner may have difficulty locating, physically locating the information in a text. They can miss lines when reading or experience physical discomfort. But remember, if any learner experiences these difficulties, you should always refer to the appropriate specialist, such as an optician or an optometrist. But in the classroom, small adjustments can be made to make this more comfortable. Dyslexia friendly font, and uh, we have information on this on the BDA website. Using off white paper, changing the background on screens and whiteboards, good lighting, try larger prints and spacing on your worksheets. Um, sometimes learners are actually prescribed coloured overlays, or you can advise to change the accessibility settings on your computer, tablet, or device. I have to say, I often work on the screen with it in night mode because it reduces the glare. And here is our final activity. Can you remember this information? I'm going to say 10 items from a shopping list. Listen carefully, but don't write them down. When I have finished, write down the items in reverse order. And here we go. Bananas coffee, ham, newspaper, cleaning products, loaf of bread, chocolate biscuits, skimmed milk, 
tomatoes, butter. Pick up your pen, try and write the items down in reverse order. Okay, and the answer is butter, tomatoes, skimmed milk, chocolate biscuits, loaf of bread, cleaning products, newspaper, ham, coffee, bananas. You probably do feel bananas by now. How did this make you feel? Perhaps overwhelmed, under pressure, or maybe you use some strategies such as visualizing or uh, making quick notes or um, conjuring up images in your head. Really, adults should be able to remember up to approximately seven items, but the additional challenge of being asked to manipulate that information under pressure is quite stressful. A learner with dyslexia may only be able to remember a very few items in the short term memory, such as, um, you know, this is the part of the memory we use to remember somebody's name after just meeting them, and it's easy to quickly forget. Um, working memory is the ability to hold on to something in that short term memory and do something with it. A difficulty with this means that complex tasks that involve multitasking or multi operations will be challenging. Um, in the case of our shopping list activity, that would have been remembering the verbal instructions, recalling items from short term memory, manipulating it into reverse order, writing it down, and the time pressure. Tasks that require this in the classroom could be remembering the instructions the teacher's given, reading comprehension, mental maths calculations, essay writing, note taking, exams and tests. Now reflect on how often these tasks are demanded of our learners within a school day. They experience fatigue quickly, could become overloaded and overwhelmed, and can, this can quickly escalate to a lack of motivation. But for us as teachers, it can be hard to spot. This may be the learner who is appearing to not focus. Perhaps they're just working hard to process the information. Or equally, it may be the learner who calls out and is impulsive in their answers and their contributions. Maybe it is to say it before they forget. So let's move on to thinking about how dyslexia is de defined. These activities were designed to provide an experience of some of the challenges that may face an individual with dyslexia in a learning environment, regardless of age. Just as all learners are unique, so are all learners with dyslexia. Each person has their own unique learning profile. Different challenges may arise at different stages of education. Um, and an appreciation of the working definition of dyslexia increases our awareness, which in turn informs the customised approaches and resources that we may access to support and enable learning. The ROSE review is perhaps one of the, the leading definitions of dyslexia used in the UK and often referred to in diagnostic assessment reports. Um, and you can see the key features here are ones that um, have been sort of covered within the activities at the start of the, the presentation. So difficulty with fluent word reading and spelling, um, phonological awareness, verbal memory, that being able to remember those verbal instructions and processing speed. Dyslexia can occur across a range of intellectual abilities. It's best thought of as a continuum, not a distinct category. And there's no clear cut off and as we see in our day-to-day -day practice, many of our learners don't just have difficulties of a dyslexic nature. They often have co-occurring difficulties too, maybe with motor skills, language, maths, concentration or organisation. But those in themselves don't indicate um, a, a diagnosis of dyslexia. The BDA offers an additional consideration to this definition as well, and acknowledges visual processing um, as an area of difficulty for some. Um, but also that those with dyslexia have learning differences, 
and they can show a combination of abilities and difficulties. Um, it's important to consider the learner as a whole, holistically, their strengths and difficulties, and celebrate their strengths, talents and interests. So enjoy this video clip. I'm hoping I can share it with you on the screen. And it features individuals with dyslexia recognizing the superpower they would most like to own to break through barriers in their own learning skills. Dyslexic superhero. I'd be called Red Line Man. I type all my poems on the computer, and all I get all the time is like Red Line, Red Line, Red Line. Super speller, and I'd be able to scan through documents, instantly zap it, and correct it with my eyes. I would be a computer girl, so I could put on paper or anywhere exactly what I was thinking about at any time. Ooh, if I was a dyslexic superhero, um, okay, so uh, I'd probably. Um, I would be helicopter girl and I'd be able to instantly go up to a helicopter height and be able to view wherever I'm wa ne wanting or needing to go from above so that I can quickly find out where to go because I get so lost. My name would be... Uh, um, God, Ed. I would be book girl and I would go around finding books and I would creatively respell all of the words to make them much more interesting. Focus girl and I would be able to focus on things for a long period of time and actually get things finished. Uh, this is really difficult. Uh, okay, my name would be, be, be something like... Probably super filer, and it would be organisation. So I'd go around my room doing everything really quickly. Superman has the same power, actually. Captain Order, and my superpower would be um, I'd have a special wand and I would zap on people's desks and it helps to keep um, their day-to-day -day life at work uh, very organised. Cosmos. Something to make life easier. The thing with me is, right, which is, if I change any part of me, right, and my growing up the way I am, I wouldn't be where I am now. And I've got fantastic wife, fantastic kids. I've just written my own book and I wouldn't have done that if any part of me had changed. So I can either look at the bad parts and say, all change them, but if I did, I wouldn't have the good parts. Dis dislikes a lot. <laughs> Captain Order. <laughs> she loves to organise your life. Captain Order. She takes out the trouble and strife. Wow. Uh. <laughs> okay, hopefully you enjoyed that uh, video clip there. And it always makes me think of the children in the classroom or the young students you work with, that uh, yes, they may have dyslexia, but they will also be adults with dyslexia in the future. And it makes you reflect on that longer learning journey. So now we move on to taking steps to breaking through these barriers to learning. So what is the dyslexia friendly classroom? It's an inclusive and supportive environment, access to multi-sensory resources and equipment. Um, learning often takes place uh, through more than one sense at a, at a time. So if you can access more than one sense in the planning of your tasks and the activities, it can reinforce a stronger learning memory. Um, lessons are pre-prepared and structured so the learners know what's coming up. There are regular breaks and um, opportunities for overlearning, maybe different modes of presentation to make the information accessible. Time, one of the biggest things we all need these days and we need in the classroom, time to complete tasks and time to process new information. Um, we need to mark sensitively and give constructive feedback. And we also need to make sure our learners feel good about themselves, good self-esteem and confidence, generating independence and securing those positive and vivid learning memories that they can access in the future. 
I have an analogy I'd like to share with you, and it, it always makes me think of the dyslexia friendly classroom. Imagine a visit to the city of London. Consider how information is made quickly accessible to the masses. The tube maps are colour coded. They're accompanied with large posters everywhere. You have an app. There are announcements on, on the tannoy. There are interactive museum tours with tour guides and devices, translating information into your own language and um, guiding you around the displays. Buses arrive every 10 minutes. If your uh, sense of time is poor, you've got no fear of missing a bus. You've got access to apps on your phone to navigate your way to places. There are visual signs, digital notice boards, audio announcements to communicate messages. Logos are vibrant, colorful and memorable and adverts appear everywhere to reinforce memory of the latest West End show or place to visit. However, we do have in London the parks and quieter areas to take a break from the fast pace of everyday life and protect against overstimulation. All of these foster the key approaches that make our dyslexia friendly learning environment. Here are some general tips for the, the classroom. Um, or study space. And it may involve any of the following. Considering seating position, um, you know, free from distraction, where they can learn in an optimum space for them. Uh, clear presentation, avoid busyness in your presentations and detail, too much detail. Sit next to a good friend or study buddy. Develop communication with home and tutors. Provide digital uh, visual checklists, sorry, and reminders with oral explanations. Encourage our learners to do self-checking so they can begin to gain that ownership over their learning. Avoid extensive copying, chunk instructions into steps, and if possible, access to technology. But ultimately, the best thing you can do is to ask your learners um, what works for them. Consider how learners may be supported outside of the classroom too, especially with homework and independent study. Parent power is key here. They're often keen to support and they know their children best. And it can be really effective to offer training and support workshops to them. Um, uh, I've offered uh, training in the past and collaborated with our ICT department in a school and we ran a Google Chromebook workshop to show parents how to access the apps that we are encouraging our learners to. Encourage them to read stories to their children and encourage uh, regular reading, practice spellings in multi-sensory and active ways and tips of how to support with organisation and homework but most importantly, encourage them to seek those opportunities for fun, interests, hobbies and clubs too. For adult learners, you might like to encourage the support of a good friend or mentor. Uh, the BDA and your local dyslexia association have um, great links to support. Um, and you know, with our social media platforms today, um, that feeling of connection is, is there instantly on the phones. Um, celebrate dyslexia with the family, friends and community and spread awareness. Considering the learner's experience holistically is important, but ultimately, as educators, we are striving to get our learners ready to access learning. We want them to be in a place to begin learning, thus empowering them. OK, so now we've reflected on the barriers and um, also reflected on what makes a really good dyslexia friendly environment. We're going to break through these barriers further. We move on to the specific resources um, to break down the barriers to literacy, starting with reading. So these strategies are specific to the barrier of actually decoding the words on the page. This is so important to facilitate as it provides the gateway to reading for understanding. Reading needs to be a secure skill so that the curriculum itself can be accessed. Multisensory approaches work best. They work best for memorizing and decoding new vocabulary. Before starting a new topic, it's worth spending time on securing the new words and vocab that's likely to be encountered. And some of these games could form part of an introduction to a lesson or a plenary. 
They can be played individually, in pairs, small groups, or as a class. None of them are reinventing the wheel. They're the good old fashioned hands-on games we've always played, but they can be customized into word-based games. Flashcard games like Pelminism, Matching Pairs, Bingo, Snap. Word building with letter tiles, onset and rhyme, um, using the tiles in banana grams. I, I used to work with GCSE students who at the start of each lesson would build the key words in their topic, say for a biology exam, um, to see, to see how many they could build. So it's a good revision um, session as well. Word hunt, hunt around the room physically for words, highlighting text or skim and scan in newspapers. Trace, feel uh, the letters, use fabric, glitter glue, uh, your finger in a salt tray, um, modelling materials. And this isn't just for our early years. This can be used with uh, students of all ages. And displays, make sure they're customised and visual with, with uh, the information to support learning. And again, technology can be useful as well as um, setting up shared reading. Okay, so um, once the decoding barrier has been lessened, then the information needs to be held in the working memory, manipulated and comprehension facilitated. Many of our learners need that additional time to read through the text several times to access meaning and process information. And these are a few techniques to facilitate that. So we've talked about pre-teaching vocabulary before the topic or before accessing the book and the use of multi-sensory approaches. Um, another idea is to experience the key themes in the story or the text that you're about to read. This could be through exploring objects in a box, puppetry, uh, models using a video clip, generating discussion. Set up research groups so that uh, students are working in pairs to investigate information together. Encourage questioning. Um, get them to think of questions they'd like to ask about this text. Read along with the audio book or even on an e-book. Um, there's a really good series of dyslexia friendly books um, and the publishers are called Barrington Stoke and they produce the books on off-white paper with friendly font, but also they're producing more and more books that are, are classic texts and popular fiction. Um, and they also have a really good website with resources to accompany that as well to develop comprehension. And another fun activity is to draw the events in the story as someone reads it out loud. Okay, so thinking about our learners as they progress through education, they need those academic reading skills, um, the ability to interpret a question, training and identifying the command words. Can help with that. Um, another technique is identifying the topic sentence or the first sentence of every paragraph on a page or in a text or chapter. Um, when they've done that, it very quickly provides an overall sort of summary of what they're going to be reading about, but it also logs in their mind where specific actions might take place. And then they can go and locate the information they need to answer questions providing time, um, summarising and sharing with the class. Can they tell other people? Can they tell somebody next to them what, they, what the text is about? And using the six W questions, who, what, why, when, where and how. And I have to confess, when I was reading a lot of research material for my master's degree and selecting what was useful and what wasn't, I think I used the six Ws constantly. <laughs> who wrote it? Uh, why did they write it? What was the purpose of writing this article? Okay, how did they get their evidence across um, and to support their points? Okay, another technique, SQ3R, similar approach, surveying, questioning, reading, um, explaining what you've read and reviewing. Providing PowerPoint and lecture notes in advance of the lesson or lecture can be really helpful and making sure that they can use these book skills to access information. Um, most importantly, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, our learners will say to us, I hate reading, or I've got to be honest, miss, I don't read at home. 
<laughs> so what can you do to encourage reading for interest? Tap into their special interests. Check out the local library. You will be surprised at the, the number of events that some libraries hold today. Um, and even meet the librarian. Go up to the school library. There are some fantastic librarians in, in schools and colleges that are keen to help and provide that supportive study space. Visit a book festival, meet your favourite authors, watch films and performances of classic stories and texts, listen to podcasts and radio dramas, and read to family members or even different generations. So this is a, a topic now close to my heart and um, it's based on oral language activities. And remember that oral language can often be a strength for our learners with dyslexia. So use it to make the text tangible. Speak it aloud, read it and walk it at the same time. Mime and role play, actively story tell um, the outline of the play or the story. Vocabulary based games, uh, games like Articulate, Just a Minute, um, Who Am I? These can actually be customised into revision games. Storytelling or story dice, uh, catch a story, throw a part, say a part of the story, throw it to the next person to continue. Or even linked across curricular subjects in the role of an expert. So what I mean here is an imagined scenario. It might be reenacting um, a historical battle performing a chemical reaction through dance, adding music to it as well. All these things make learning tangible. Okay, so I'm sure you all agree that taking the stress out of spelling, if we had one of those superpowers or magic ones, we would do it in an instant. Accessing um, a spelling dictionary, not one for meanings, but a spelling dictionary such as the ACE dictionary can be really um, useful. Um, providing glossaries and word banks, encouraging the learner to look at the way a word shape is shaped um, and illustrate it to contain that meaning, using mnemonics, um, chunking as we've mentioned and segmenting words into sounds or syllables. Um, remove the focus on spelling and marking, have great displays with keywords visible, um, teaching spelling rules, Saying the letter names out loud as you write the word can actually help to reinforce that memory. Think about how the word is formed through modelling. And morphology. Build word sounds. For example, the word autobiography can be split into meanings as auto, bio, graph and e. Auto meaning self, bio meaning life, graph meaning to write. You've got a book that you've written about yourself. But from that, you can get your students to investigate all the other parts, all the other words that could be made or generated. Bio, biography, biology. Um, and it can really open up a world to, to spelling the words correctly, but also learning new vocabulary as well. And again, the word building games. OK, so our learners may have lots of ideas. But when it comes to getting these down on paper, then a multitude of barriers may be experienced. Um, it's often the hardest part is just to get started. So what can you do? Begin with planning, provide time to talk, share process and make connections, talk it through. Verbalizing ideas can help with forming a structure. Our visual learners might prefer to plan the big picture using mind mapping, story frames or graphic organisers. But some prefer to organise as a list and think in more of a linear way about the information they've got. They can find mind mapping too busy. Um, organise for specific targets. What do you know? What do you want to know? And what have you learned? And at the bottom there, it says smart targets, which I'm sure um, we're all familiar with. All of these uh, provide structures to get started and get motivated with writing. So you've got them started. How do you keep them writing? <laughs> Scaffold the writing process. Take it apart. Um, I've used this technique for many years um, and 
you can begin by asking them to list keywords to do with the topic you want them to write about. OK, so list the keywords in bullet points, no more than uh, five or ten at the most. Once you've done that, go to the next stage, ask them to organise them. What are you going to talk about first? What will come next? And so on. Then the next stage is to generate a sentence for each of those words. Um, but set a word limit, say, right, you have to use eight words in each sentence, minimum, OK? It's quite fascinating how quickly somebody can produce eight sentences using this technique. And what it does, it empowers our learners. They've got started and it's enabled them to produce something on paper. Auditory learners may prefer to dictate their ideas and replay it. Kinesthetic learners might like to use post-it notes, coloured cards, postcards and labels and dot them out all over the room. Uh, I once had a headmaster who used to put all his minutes from his meetings all over the floor in his office. Classic visual learner. <laughs> and provide sentence starters and useful phrases. OK. Give them additional time. I know it's hard, but try to avoid using break times for unfinished work if you can. And also, these are the learners who often have a portfolio of, of uh, tasks at the end of the academic year, and it's all unfinished work. We want to try and get them to finish a piece of work. Um, support with handwriting. Think about the ergonomics. How are they sitting? What equipment are they using? Um, the National Handwriting Association has a really good range of resources that you can access. Think about alternative formats. Um, could they present their information in a PowerPoint, mind map, demonstration or interview? Teach classic paragraph structure and proofreading tips such as using COPS. Get them to proofread for capital letters first, then for organisation and punctuation and spelling. And another tip is to actually start at the end and scan backwards through your writing um, and you can pick up spelling errors quicker that way because you're looking at it out of context. Good tip for us as teachers when we're marking work too. And finally, those academic skills for our, our older learners. Um, the Peel framework is a really good one to use. Um, it makes you think of being in the role of a lawyer, make your point, back it up with examples, explain how the evidence support this, link it to the, the first point or the next point. When note taking, it is okay to encourage sub, sub vocalizing or vocalizing of ideas. I appreciate we like a nice quiet classroom, but actually saying our thoughts out loud can really help to secure memory when writing down. Question prompts again, uh, thinking maps are uh, a visual way of planning information and there's a link to that at the end of the, the presentation. And always check out what access arrangements they've been awarded. OK, so we're getting to the, the last stage of the presentation now and breaking through those barriers um, to access the curriculum. So once language has been accessed, then we want to enable the curriculum. And often this is the part that our learners are most interested in. I can't stress enough how much multisensory approaches um, uh, a powerful learning tools um, le for creating learning memories, sorry. And uh, I'm going to give you a break now for, from me speaking and show you a clip by Dr. Susie Nyman. Um, she's a curriculum manager at a school and she's teaching, um, I think, a sixth form class, uh, biology, through multisensory methods. And this has come off the um, BDA website. It's from uh, a range of videos that BDA have called Dyslexia. So hopefully you can see this. We'll just have to click through the, the adverts in a moment. Wait! Did you download Grammarly? Ladies, this morning we're going to talk about multisensory teaching. We're going to be teaching about the heart today. For Dr. Susie Nyman, more than 20 years of teaching science to non scientists has taught her that a variety of colourful and interesting multisensory techniques is needed 
to help her students engage with complex information and the correct scientific language. The students find science really difficult. They tend to be turned off when they first come into class. And so you've got to do it in a fun and exciting way. So I try to do multi-sensory techniques, i.e. using sight, smell, touch, taste, in whatever way I can. We're going to do the circulatory song and we're going to do a laminated question. Susie starts each lesson by outlining the structure of the session. Her students know exactly what to expect over the coming 60 minutes. We start off by singing the key words to a song, for example, if it's the heart, it's Michael Jackson's Beat It, and that relaxes all the students and they feel really relaxed about those key words to start with. What's this one? Pulmonary artery. Excellent. The next one? Pulmonary vein. Good. Left atrium. Next one? In the next stage, we quite often make a model, a very simple model, out of Play-Doh so that they can feel it. And recently, I've found some smelly Play-Doh that they really enjoy using. And so the red smells of strawberries, the blue smells of blueberries, the green smells of apples, and the yellow smells of bananas. So it takes the students back to their childhood, which then they start feeling safer about the subject. What they like is the commentary. When we're doing the heart, I say to them, for example, the atrium. It's the largest room in the Roman house. So they've got this hook. And what's really important for my students is that they can visualize something that they can then link back to what they've got to understand. Um, when we get to the valves, the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve, I say to them, in Sainsbury's, you try before you buy. And they can all remember that. So then they can remember the tricuspid and the bicuspid valve. And by making giant mats on the floor and walking through it, they're more likely to remember it. Which then goes to the try before you buy. So we start with the tricuspid. So the tricuspid valve, which then goes here. And then we turn to the right ventricle, which then goes here. And the first time I used the heart map with a boy, he said to me, can I do it again, please? I didn't quite get it. And he did it five times. And then he went back and taught all his friends about the heart and relayed all the different parts back to them so that they could understand it. OK. Hopefully that's given you uh, lots of ideas there for multi-sensory teaching in your own subjects and topics. Okay, so as we come uh, towards the, the last section of the presentation, we're going to be looking at speed of processing and memory. And often um, these can be the most frustrating barriers, not just for our learners, but for us as teachers as well, to know how to help them. Um, so what can you do? You can provide protected time for tasks. Encourage uh, a listening position. Um, I once taught one student who uh, always wore a blank expression and I explained to him, well, look, you see, the thing is, your teachers don't know that you're actually thinking about the information. You need to use a key phrase and say, um, give me a moment, sir, I'm thinking about that and then I'll answer you. You know, equipping them with those phrases. But actually, on the rugby pitch, he was a star <laughs> because his opponents never knew what he was thinking. Um, a very easy technique, count to five after asking a question. Um, you'd be surprised how often an answer will appear um, after that amount of time. Um, and plan tasks in chunks. Provide short natural breaks and, and get them moving, guard against fatigue and reduce that timed element of the tasks. You know, you know how you felt at the start of this presentation with only 10 seconds to, to create things. Um, provide them with additional time and check in often, see how they are. Opportunities to revisit topics and skills, visual reminders, and of course, provide those active learning breaks. And finally, giving working memory a helping hand. Really, the techniques for supporting speed of processing work for this as well. Encourage in vocalizing each step and thought process as a task is performed. Uh, practice in different ways. Um, present the complex task in steps. Uh, give them support strategies. Teach someone else. Revisit through games and activities often. 
Um, and also um, encourage them to have a little pocket notebook. Um, I taught one learner with dyslexia who had a notebook full of what he had to do that day, full of key things to remember, and it, it was a lifeline to him. Um, we couldn't have this presentation without thinking about technology. It's increasingly a part of, of our daily lives and the um, sort of enabling sort of opportunities it's given to, to individuals with dyslexia is incredible. Um, encourage them to check out the accessibility options on, a mobile, on their mobile phones, tablets, laptops, or on computer. Uh, word processing software like Microsoft Word and Google. Now, you know, voice typing, dictate, proofreading functions are all built in um, to this software for people to access. Um, apps such as calendar apps to help with organization. And the great thing is not only can you access this information across devices, you can work in a shared way as well. Um, there is an excellent company called Call Scotland C-A-L-L, -L. you can visit their website and access um, tips and techniques and apps and how to use software for learners, um, you know, uh, with all sorts of specific learning difficulties. It really is a great website. Um, Customise the interactive whiteboard, that's good for, for all learners, not just those with dyslexia, change the background colour, uh, put subtitles on with videos, um, audio books, video clips, podcasts and apps for learning and that I'm sure with uh, VR and all sorts of uh, groundbreaking things in technology um, this will become an even more exciting area of learning. So to finish off we have to think about self-esteem and confidence. This is crucial. Um, nobody can learn if they're not feeling uh, positive, happy and confident about themselves. And integrating metacognition into our lessons, which is an understanding about how we learn, can really empower our learners. It teaches them to be aware of their own thought processes and to question what works for me. We want these learners to come into the classroom as, you know, and advocate for themselves. They said, could I have a, a reading ruler for that because it helps me line up the text, for example. Think about everything in their environment, their physical needs, emotional needs, learning styles and preferences, and develop that metacognitive culture in the classroom. Teach it by asking um, them to be self-reflective, ask them questions about their learning. And, you know, ultimately, this will empower them, not just for the, the time they're with you, perhaps, but through their, their long learning journey. And finally, celebrate dyslexia. Create a feeling of belonging in your learning environment. Celebrate strengths and interests, even if these take place outside of the school environment. Um, you know, we're thinking about the longer learning journey here. Um, talk about famous people and role models in the community and learning environment with dyslexia. Explore professions and clubs that foster these strengths, whether they're creative, engineering, problem solving, musical, performance, sport, design, people skills, business, cookery, the list goes on. Empower and enlighten. Break, it, break through these barriers with your learners and continue to be amazed and fascinated by their contribution to your schools and communities as they continue um, to teach us as educators about the complexities and intricacies of how we learn. Thank you for listening to the webinar. I appreciate it was quite a lot of information there. Um, we're gonna go over to uh, Bex and Sarah now, hopefully to start our Q&A session. Thank you. Hi. Me again. Um, so we have a few questions in the q and I don't know if um, you want me to read them out or if you want to access them yourself. Shall I just read a few out? Yes, do so. Yes, good evening, everybody. Thank you, Anna, for a very detailed and informative <laughs> presentation. Yes, Thank you, sir. I have, I have answered some questions already, but we have still got some that we need to, to go through. So 
Rebecca, if you could read them out and we'll answer them. Thank you. Great, of course. So when testing for dyslexia, does dyscalculia come into the same test or is that something different? So the recent guidance now is that we can't assess for dyslexia and dyscalculia if we are only qualified to assess dyslexia. So you now have to have a separate qualification. So if you're uh, assessing a pupil who has uh, dyslexia, you might always also have co-occurring maths difficulties and that might be signposted, but you need to then refer to a professional who is qualified. Uh, when you have a uh, assessment qualification, it's called an APC and for dyslexia, it would be an APC for dyslexia and then there's an APC for dyscalculia. So they are now separate um, assessors that are required. Great. Uh, here, I've got one here that says, I am a teacher and have noted lots of children use their bookmarks or cards to follow where they are in the book. Is this a sign of dyslexia? Uh, is this a sign as one dyslexia type with page merging and all of that? So on its own, no, that is not a sign of dyslexia. What I would say, first of all, is those sorts of um, observations might actually signpost that the child has some visual difficulties and needs perhaps glasses, so needs to go to the optician. That's the first thing that you do. Sometimes it's how we teach children. We do tend to say to them, use your finger or use a bookmark. So it might just be learnt behaviour. But you need to look for other things as well, because dyslexia is not just about uh, possible difficulties with following a line of text. It is about underlying difficulties with skills such as phonological awareness, phonological memory and processing speed. So this is just one part of that. And not all children with dyslexia will have visual difficulties. Uh, I think recent research is about 30 to 40 percent of children might have something we call visual stress, but it is now a separate diagnosis that has to be referred to an optometrist. Right. Um, so regarding sensitive marking, would you advise not using red pens? I think um, the colour of the pen is up to the school marking policy. I think I'm more concerned about the purpose of the marking and to look at that and to think about does it match the objective of the lesson? Because the marking is really important that we are developing a positive um, feedback response and we're giving lots of praise for success. If you want to be marking the spelling, then the learner needs to know that that's the objective. If you're usually you'd want to mark the content and the knowledge that is being shown through the piece of writing. And so you'll be looking carefully at perhaps focusing on one or two spellings that, that might need support. And another really good way of helping with that is to perhaps um, look at the good bit, the bits of the word that are correct and then build on those, those areas in the strategies that Anna's obviously talked about this evening. Great. Uh, so we have somebody here that says, good evening, I work with children in EY and Key Stage 1. I'm finding students are struggling with oral segmenting. What activities would you recommend to strengthen those oral skills? Ooh, very good. Very good. <laughs> do you want to do that one, Sarah? Yes, or I'm, I'm, I'm getting one. ready to jump yes. out of my Yeah, system. I'm ready for this one. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> it's really important when we that we start at the beginning and the first uh, area that we need to develop is the oral language and we need to develop the phonological awareness skills. Now, phonological awareness is not about looking and reading and writing the letters. It's about our oral awareness of sounds. And that's what we need to develop first. So more um, focus on phonological awareness. Uh, if you're remembering letters and sounds it's those phase one activities there are things that you can uh, purchase to support such as sound linkage by uh, Hatcher and uh, Hume and I can't remember the third author maybe Anna can uh, but there are, <laughs> there are other publications obviously online some of them are free so look for google phonological awareness packs and things will come up which have wonderful resources because what you want to use is pictures and objects and get children thinking about those sounds. What we start with is syllables and then we'll move on to onset and rhyme. So at, and then we'll move on to finally manipulating and identifying those individual sounds, those phonemes. But what with reception and key stage one, early year one, 
Nelly is the thing that you need to go to, the Nuffield Early Language Intervention. It's a 20-week intervention and it has a big focus on oral language and phonological awareness at the beginning for those first 10 weeks. So do have a look at those to support um, there. Anything, and obviously sharing stories to read aloud also develops that particular language. I, I would jump in with the, the drama-based activities there. Yes, yes. Look at drama workshop games because they're all about tapping out the sound, um, clapping the syllables in the words, jumping to the beats in your name, uh, customising dances to go with the sound. So saying and doing and moving at the same time. And that will all reinforce um, that feeling for sound as well. So we'll just finish up with this last question. I just want to, um, we've had lots of questions asking about um, the slides and the presentation. So I just want to let everyone know that we will be sending around the slides afterwards along with a recording of the entire webinar. So just to clear that one up. So the last question we're going to end on tonight is, should a child be asked to speak to their class about having dyslexia? It depends on the child. Mm. if the child wants to there is a wonderful video on our website on the bdo website uh, which is called see dyslexia differently and it's a lovely thing to show how um perhaps dyslexic mm. uh, individuals see things in a different way and it's a really good start so i perhaps would suggest that that's the way into um explaining any yeah. difference it can be very empowering um, for, for children to stand up in front of their class and share that um, and, and share their experiences of dyslexia, but it has to be timed right. And you as their class teacher, their parents and, and the learner themselves, you know, you will know when, when that right moment is. But um, to, to add to Sarah's resource, there is a great book it's called the, it's probably back to front on the screen, but it's the Illustrated Guide to Dyslexia and it's amazing people. And I often use this um, to talk about dyslexia with learners when they've just been diagnosed. And, you know, it gives really good visual images into um, uh, appreciating the dyslexic profile and the strengths as well. Okay, so that's a, that's a really good book. And they've got a great Instagram page as well. So um, perhaps I'll add that onto the PowerPoint slides uh, to send out. That's great. Thank you, Anna. Um, if your question wasn't answered this evening, we have an absolutely amazing helpline team who are available Tuesday through Thursday and all their contact details can be found on our website in which you can give them a call or a message or however you like to communicate and they will be able to signpost you to the right department for them to help you with your question. So uh, that's all we have time for this evening. Thank you so much, ladies, for being here and presenting the webinar for us. Um, just a reminder that all the information that you might need can be found on our website, um, along with our social media. Um, of course, we've had lots of great things going out this week for Dyslexia Awareness Week. Um, so that just leaves me to say thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And we'll be sending around the slides and you'll be hearing from us shortly. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Bye. you very much. Bye-bye.